Welcome to this year's Friday lunchtime Lent addresses from St. Edmundsbury Cathedral. With the uncertainties around lockdown, we are holding these lunchtime addresses online, virtually. We thank you for joining us wherever you are. The lunchtime addresses this year are led by curates from around our diocese. We're grateful to them for their contributions to this series. They will share with us reflections and experiences of their journeys of faith. Here's a slide with details of this week's speaker and the outline for this week's address. Hello, my name is Reverend Ginny Williams from Sancroft Benefice. I've been asked to share um, a bit of my reflection story with you and I want to start with a few couple of verses from Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Seven years ago, in 2014, I decided to spend Lent finding out what it meant to thirst for God. Earlier on, my New Year's resolution had been to read more of the Old Testament, to address some of the less palatable aspects of the Bible. Little did I know what a rich endeavour that would turn out to be. Looking back, I now see that I was exploring my faith and I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to make sense of what had been happening over the years and what I should be thinking about what to do next. Two things happened around Easter that year. In March, I was sitting on a plane coming back from Africa. It was dark and there was no one near me when it felt like someone just leant over and said in a very normal voice, I want you to be a vicar. A conversation followed in my head where I asked lots of questions and the voice became more and more exasperated and then stopped. My main question was, why a vicar? It was clearly something to do with the Church of England when I knew I had big problems and I'd fallen out with it so badly as a young adult. In the years running up to this point, I'd found my way back into church, but at this time I was a regular at the local Baptist church. When Easter Saturday came along, I was desperate to take Holy Communion in an Anglican church. I was almost literally thirsting for God. By then I was being constantly harried by the earworm, I want you to be a vicar. And to cut a long story short, after a number of conversations with vicars, pastors, my Baptist church family and the DDO, I finally started on a process of discernment. The one thing people kept saying to me over and over again is don't be a vicar unless you can find peace doing anything else. So my discernment, the first part of my discernment involved moving to an Anglican church, which was very painful after being part of a very supportive Baptist church family for over six years. And that was the first sacrifice. The second sacrifice involved giving up my beloved job running a tuberculosis project for the International Council of Nurses. I'd worked in the tuberculosis field for 20 years and as far as I was concerned, it was my vocation to work in the poorest parts of the world, serving some of the most deprived communities. It was fulfilling and exhausting in equal measure 
as I would be away from my family for at least a week a month. I'd often be quite traumatised when I got home, but I just had to get on with being mum and running the project from my Suffolk home. And to be truthful, I felt overly blessed when I knew what situation many people were living in around the world. The one thing you're told you absolutely must not do at the beginning of your discernment is to make any drastic changes. The problem was that I, that I could not give what I needed to to the project and at the same time give my full attention to my discernment. So I gave up my nursing career. The reason I ignored the advice and thought it was okay to leave my job was because of all the amazing things that had been happening when I started handing my life over to God. The project I'd been leading was incredibly successful, far beyond anything I'd hoped for. And while I would love to take the credit for that, it was quite clear that God was all over it. I lost count of the number of times people told me that what I was doing was impossible. And it's miraculous how much got done when I was at my lowest ebb. I was sick a lot of the time with all the travelling and even when something, and even had something like a, a nervous breakdown two years in. It was a really good lesson of how God uses us in our weakness. The more I gave it all to God in prayer and with committed prayer support from my Baptist church family, the better the project succeeded. The right people kept turning up when the project needed them and doors opened when the time was right. I was having breakfast in Beijing in 2010 with an American nursing professor I'd never met before. And when I told her we needed a nurse consultant who is experienced in the field and fluent in English and Mandarin Chinese, she said, I know just the person. That person, Carrie Tudor, who appeared so miraculously, was the other reason I was able to leave the project. After working with her for three years, I knew it was safe to leave it in her very capable hands. I could not possibly attribute the project's success to my own efforts, or even to the efforts of the army of people who were involved. When asked to write it up for a scientific journal, I kept putting it off, as I knew God was the main reason for its success and sound scientific evidence would be required for it to be accepted for publication. The deeper I was going in my faith, the more frustrating it became that I could not witness to it. Training workshops, especially in Africa, would start and end in prayer and singing, and I used to muse that if I tried that in the UK, I would be suspended from nursing if not struck off. Professionally, God and my work had to be kept separate, while all the time they were becoming more and more intertwined. It was time to go deeper. I wanted to open my whole life and self to God. The project had taught me to let God work through me, to get out of the way. Like a tap which needs to be opened to let water through, we can get in the way of God's purposes for us by refusing to open up and let him work through us. And possibly more importantly, let his love flow through us. In the end, I was selected for training and now nearly two years into my curacy, I can confidently say that I'm more at peace than I've ever been. I'd like to finish with Malcolm Guite's sonnet on Psalm 42. You are my heart's desire from first to last. Like as the heart desires the water brooks, so longs my soul towards you. So I thirst for living streams, not for the dusty books they write about you, nor the empty words that ring from the pulpits, nor the haughty looks of those who market you. These are the shards of broken idols. I long for the deep in you that calls to the deep in me.
the chords that sound those depths and summon me to weep, at first with tears of grief and then with tears of joy. That I may sow those tears and reap a timeless harvest, that the ripened ears of grain may shine as clean and clear as gold, shucked of the husk of all my wasted years. Amen. Let us pray. For he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. 
Dear Lord, the challenge over the last year has shaken us all, touched us all, taught us all. It has forced us to see injustice and inequality laid bare here and around the world. Forgive us our reluctance to look and accept what has been shown to us. Help us to move beyond a feeling of helplessness in the face of such immense challenges and see that with you anything is possible. Give us the courage to emerge from this pandemic and insist on a fairer society and dignity for all people. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labour in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. Forgive us, Lord, for relying on our own strength, for thinking we know what's best for your church and your people without watching and waiting in obedience to you. Help us to take this opportunity to grow your church for and with all your people. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. Dear Lord, so many have suffered so much in the last year. We lift up to you all who are hungry, hungry for food, hungry for company, hungry for comfort and an end to their pain. Open our eyes, Lord, and help us to see each other more clearly. Open our hearts, Lord, so your love and care may flow through us all. Show us what to do, knowing that you will provide whatever we need to live in obedience to you. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. And a blessing from the International Women's Day of Prayer, which feels so apt this week. May the God of Eve teach you to dance. May the God of Hagar bring you comfort in the desert. May the God of Miriam bring companions to you when you struggle. May the God of Deborah teach you courage for your battles. May the Christ who knew Mary and Martha show you the way of balance. May the Christ who healed the bent over woman heal your pain. May the Christ of Mary Magdala send you out to proclaim your story. In the name of Christ, who is the memory and hope of the future. Amen. And finally, from the Paradox Blessing. May God bless you with the foolishness to think that you can make a difference in the world so that you will do the things which others tell you cannot be done. Amen.